little gentleman, let me turn this way so I can, it might be okay. Good. Well, we are in lesson eight um, in our booklets, and as with the texts from Genesis and Exodus, our examination of the Deuteronomic text is to be considered in light of the possibility that major portions of the Torah were considered and composed while Israel was in Babylonian captivity. We talked about that before. Previously, I had put forth the conjecture that it was while Israel was in exile that Israel had the time and the space to reflect upon her behavior that led to her 586 exile. Among other consequences, such a time of reflection became for Israel the creative impetus to compose the text that now comprise what we know as the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. And previous lessons have pointed to the ingredients that went into exile, into Israel of exile, exilic captivity, behaviors that contributed to her apostasy. In the previous three lessons, the accounts of human drama reveal both the struggles that Israel experienced as God's chosen people and as Israel evolved into becoming a unified nation. Familial conflict between Cain and Abel, impatience displayed by Sarah and Abraham, and the reception of the Book of the Covenant from God into the corporate life of Israel remind us not only of humanity's imperfections, as well as its need for reform, but especially of the ways God is willing to become involved to intervene into human affairs. Such divine intervention is to be understood as I have been advocating, not solely in terms of punitive justice, but especially, especially to the degree to which God is willing to intervene for the sake of saving God's people from themselves, and thus restoring relationship, both human and divine. The text today before us points to the end God seeks for the welfare and future of divine creation, that is, salvation. Like the text from Genesis and Exodus, the Deuteronomic text provides another example of how hands-on God was and is and intends to remain for the sake of God's people. Such divine intervention is, I believe, nothing less than good news, kind of good news amplified in the New Testament through the incarnation to the one who has promised to intervene always for the sake of our ultimate salvation. One assumption I am making about Israel's reflective period in, Bab in Babylonian captivity is Israel's candor about herself. During Israel's captivity, I am assuming Israel reflected upon her predicament and came to terms with what prompted her captivity. Of all the insights Israel might have explored, the one insight of disobedience towards God may have preoccupied Israel in particular. And I think the, the, the parallel is that Years ago, when you and I were sent to our room, usually our mothers would have said to us, well, you go to your room and think about what you've done. Well, that is comparable to what Israel has experienced in her captivity. A high school principal would do that same thing. Right. Just think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Well, Israel, Israel must have come to the conclusion that any future rehabilitation would need to begin with a renewed obedience to God. Such an insight would have prompted the need for Moses to enunciate the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
Might those words from Moses be an obvious indication of Israel's primary problem? Israel had a hard time doing what? Listening to God. If disobedience, if poor listening was a contributing factor in Israel's apostasy, one critical solution would be to embark upon a new willingness to listen to God and thus to experience how listening to God shapes and forms beneficially Israel's life in order for her to become and to remain the people that she failed to be and thus resulting in her captivity. Moses' admonition to Israel to listen to God, to listen with the belief that the Lord is our God, a God who is with Israel, who is on Israel's side, and thus worthy to be loved and listened to with every fiber of Israel's being, that admonition anticipates the new way Israel is to be organized internally, especially civilly. It seems logical to conclude that the Mosaic emphasis on a system of justice for Israel is God's way of getting Israel's attention, of intervening, of seeking to shape and form Israel from the inside out. If there was moral and judicial rot at the core of Israel's life, if the lack of right judgments within Israel's civil life were symptomatic of her unfaithful relationship with God, then it might appear that God is employing a spiritual scalpel to remove the rot in order to promote healing and health within Israel's being. According to the first section of our assigned text, there is no subtle correlation between a healthy judicial system and living well in the land God has provided to Israel. So then let's, let's hear what Moses has to say here to Israel from a portion of Deuteronomy 16. Moses is speaking and we hear Moses say, you shall appoint judges and officials throughout your tribes in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you. They shall render just decisions for the people. You must not distort justice. You must not show partiality. You must not accept bribes, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. Justice and only justice you shall pursue, so that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God has given you. As our study guide points out, Moses sought to impress upon Israel the reality of what it means to be God's chosen people, that God is present in all parts of Israel's life. And I want to underscore all parts. The reminder of divine involvement, of divine intervention, was intended to call Israel back to the covenantal relationship God made in the beginning with Abraham. Through that relationship and through the renewal of that relationship, Israel, especially Israel's priests and judges, would be called to a faithful obedience of and participation in a legal code indicative of God's identity. As we read through the Torah, God's identity is characterized by justice. Hence, Israel's legal code, as Moses emphasizes, is to be grounded on justice and only justice but justice in terms of fairness and righteousness. And why? Because justice is one of the salient representations of God's identity, especially when it comes to God's relationship with Israel. Thus, through the ways Israel lives life, through the 
to the ways Israel orders her life, especially through her civil life, the nations of the earth would become informed about and introduced to the one and only living God. One conclusion that might be made through the linkage between divine justice and a just civil society is the establishment of shalom. Shalom, peace. Peace with oneself, peace with one's God, and peace with one's neighbors, if not peace with one's enemies, is, of course, the peace we hear later coming from the angels who celebrate the Messiah's earthly birth. In light of the cited linkage between justice and peace, it would follow that such a link would be prevalent in verdicts rendered and obedience to those verdicts. Obedience to the law and its application is ultimately obedience to whom? To God. Let's listen to the importance that Moses places upon being and remaining obedient and law-abiding citizens. If a judicial decision is too difficult for you to make between one kind of bloodshed and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any such matters of dispute in your towns, then you shall immediately go to the place that the Lord your God will choose where you shall consult with the Levitical priests and the judge who was in office in those days. They shall announce to you the decision in the case. Carry out exactly the decision that they announce to you from the place that the Lord will choose, diligently observing everything they instruct you. You must carry out fully the law that they interpret for you, or the ruling that they announce to you, do not turn aside from the decision that they announce to you, either to the right or to the left. As for anyone who presumes to disobey the priest appointed to minister there to the Lord our to the Lord your God or the judge, that person shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid. They will not act presumptuously again. Well, there's some fine print there that obviously you want to take note of. That if you don't obey the law and the, and the judgments that have been made and given to you, you're going to die. When it comes to Israel's legal system, the study guide reminds us of an important metaphor. Chapter. Throughout Old Testament passages, the use of the term shepherd is used to describe the ways that leaders were expected to govern the people. Israel's leaders, especially its future kings, were expected to emulate the way shepherds watched over and cared for their father. Although numerous texts can be cited where shepherd is employed, one attribute of a shepherd is the calling of the sheep and their subsequent obedience to what they hear from the shepherd. The shepherd motif is encountered in the Old and the New Testaments. In the Old, it's Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34. But drawing from John's Gospel, we recall Jesus, the Good Shepherd, informing the disciples that because he is the Good Shepherd, his sheep, those who believe in him, those who trust him, will recognize his voice and they will do what? Obey. John 10, 16. Of course, knowing and recognizing the voice does not guarantee obedience to that voice. Such obedience, some would contend, is possible only when only when the relationship is grounded and defined in a particular way. Seems to me one could construe love to be that grounding, that particular way. Only then do we recognize the direction and the intent of the Shabbat, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord, your God, with all your heart. Even when the way ahead becomes difficult or murky, if there is love, obedience may not be far behind. And that illuminates the reason for the admonition of what Moses says in the Shema. Is it then a stretch to believe that love was indeed behind Moses' admonishment to Israel to listen to God? Might such love be the key for Israel to prosper in the promised land and to remain hopeful during her period of exile? During Israel's time of exilic reflection, might Israel have made the connection between a lack of love for God and the disobedience that resulted a disobedience that precipitated Israel's exile, a costly exile, into captivity. The emphasis for Israel to be and to remain obedient to God cannot be overstated. At the risk of oversimplifying Israel's complex relationship with God, I want to place added emphasis on the importance of listening. Yes, for the sake of Israel's Israel's welfare, but no less listening on the part of the church. Building upon what the study guide provides when it comes to spiritual development, it seems logical to assign listening a strategic role in the realm of Israel's spiritual development, which you and I, as members of the body of Christ, have inherited. Tell and unless we listen to God, then for the sake of love, the result will be a certain captivity, not of Babylonian origin, but by an enemy far more fearful ourselves. If like Cain, we do not master the enemy at the door of our heart, our captivity will have consequences that far exceed any punitive judgment God could ever impose upon us. However, if we surrender ourselves to a listening obedience to God, we may well come to discover that God is indeed to be found in the land of our living, to which we can only but say, thanks be to God. So those are my formal remarks. <clears throat> Let me ask you all about what you read in this portion of Deuteronomy. What is, uh, aside from what I've uh, laid out, why is all this minutia, this legal minutia, important, do you think, for Israel's future when she is out of her exilic timeout? Okay, to me, it was the... Uh... This thing about the societies going from nomadic societies, following their sheep, raising their sheep to, I didn't think about the Babylonian captivity, but to a more civil society where you have land, you have crops, and where does not fall star that gives stock, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, 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 so I began to think about that aspect of uh, the, the need for structure, the need. The need for rules, the need for law, that judges and right. have honest, <laughs> honest judges, honest, honest lawyers. In that sense. So that's how my mind first read that. Yeah, so so these are all building blocks for a, for a society that is uh, dependable and uh, consistent in its, um, yeah. in its identity. Yeah. Right. And I think that we. Um, in recent months and years, we've come to see that uh, some of those building blocks are rather uh, fragile at times. But we realize that we can, uh, uh, if we play too loose or too uh, careless with those building blocks, it can come tumbling down on us. Well, it's the Babylonian captivity for uh, two generations. 
I believe you saw, I think it was about what, 40, 40 years. It was, a, I mean, it, was, it was a while. So somebody would have been pressing that it just God's spirit to say, it'll end at some point. That right. Okay. But we just remember now. now the lamentation. Here we are. Right. With, with our country, our temple's been destroyed. Right. Here we've taken out of there. And you need, mm -hmm. and the Lord would say, you need to be prepared to go out of here. Yeah. Uh, set to be a people, set to be a unified nation, set to be my people. Uh, I've never thought about it uh, until recently, but um, yeah, this is anthropomorphizing God, but does God become embarrassed when we act foolish? Because we are his. Uh, like a parent would feel embarrassed at the behavior of a child or a teenager or a young adult. I don't know, but I think there's something there worth uh, considering. That uh, can we cause the good Lord embarrassment? Jeez, I hope not. I mean, that would be awfully, uh, awfully embarrassing on our part. It's always there to forgive, also. Right, uh, thank God, yeah. Uh, thank you, it's that grace, that element of grace, is why it's so important that we realize that if we do end up embarrassing, uh, our heavenly God, there's that spirit of grace uh, that wraps itself around us, and we are forgiven. Yeah. And because God forgives us, then we have reason to forgive ourselves. Well, this sense of justice, and as our study guide is pointing out, um, is, uh, is important because we realize that. Uh, we are called to be just people because God was a just God. This is just not a good idea that God came up with one day that, you know, you all need to be just and fair and kind with each other and with your neighbors and even with your enemies. But this is part of the identity that God has revealed through, uh, through the covenant, through the book of the covenant. This is who God is at baseline. God, our God, and we see this, we hear this in the Psalms, that uh, you know, restore, oh God, uh, the justice of your people. Uh, I know that you are a just God. So justice is not, it's not a passing interest. It is a main keystone in who God is. Uh, and it is out of justice. It is out of love, rather, that justice flows. Thank heavens. There's, as we said before, there's always that uh, restorative spirit of justice that our God is, is uh, characterized by, not punitive, but restorative sense of justice. Well, um, we wrap up our uh, January uh, lessons uh, next Sunday, and uh, next Sunday we continue in, in Deuteronomy. And uh, so, we will uh, reconvene ourselves at that time for Deuteronomy 24. And then, you know, it's another thought that you brought up with us in the captivity that we did that, whatever the Babylonian law was, that was structured uh, to, to sort of demand compliance with their system. And this would have happened, it would have been God's it was like, I guess, to say, you're going to need your own. Civil society or civil limits. Yes, that's that was perplexing. Well, I have to say, um, uh, the good Lord could have used the Babylonian uh, form of a civil um, formation and government as a way of showing uh, Israel what can happen when you are organized like that. Uh, Was well, it part of Babylonian purpose and deportation? The labor to take that labor. I yeah, think they took all the professionals and scattered them. I remember that. Yeah. I remember about the Roman law. Well, they would have a, a local representative there. And here it is the whole intelligentsia was deported in battle. So I sure. And I, as I, if I understand correctly, the Babylonians then put the Israelites uh, in charge of themselves. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but you have to. Be organized and, and behave yourselves, and, and we'll let you be. And then Cyrus comes in and you 
trees, uh, uh, they come on back. And I think we can see that the lessons learned are being uh, manifested in the rebuilding of what? The walls of, of Jerusalem and, and the way that they realize how important their identity is. And they, uh, their desire to listen to God. And we see that in Nehemiah and Ezra. Uh, the people are, that I think the people that came back were not the people who were deported, of course. That generation had died off, but the word continued to be uh, given down to the generations that followed. And hopefully, I guess I, I can't help but make the connection. Hopefully that is being done in our land, that despite this constitutional crisis that we've been through, uh, we don't have the founding members of uh, the country here still with us, but hopefully that, that sense of oral tradition has permeated all the generations and we realize what we have here and that it is worth preserving and taking care of and that fake news and other forms of distortion uh, should not be allowed to uh, to tear apart uh, what we have built over the last almost 250 years. But I, but I, I view this time of uh, exile uh, to be that time, as I said, as I caricatured as I caricatured it earlier, you know, where God tells Israel to go to Israel's uh, timeout room and think about what you've done. And then uh, and once you've given it some thought, uh, then we'll begin again, which is what happens uh, after the uh, that one exile. Knowing that what faces Israel after that uh, in 70 AD is what? Kind of a deja vu moment, that the destruction of the, of the second temple occurs. And uh, Rome comes in and things happen again, all over again. Almost as if Israel would have turned to herself and said, Haven't we been here before? Well, other thoughts? If not, as I used to say in grammar school, take out a sheet of paper and never it for what it said.